All right, well, welcome everyone. Apologies for my delay. I had this down as 11. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Sandra Ware. I'm the VP of Marketing Communications for Innovate BC. And we're gonna be talking about connectivity today with our panel. Innovate BC is a crown agency for the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. And what we do is help organizations across BC, across regions and communities adopt and commercialize innovation. And today we're gonna to be talking with our panel on what connectivity means and how it can be achieved by First Nations. So I'd like to welcome our panel, Michael Boncher for uh, FNBDA, he's the Managing Director. Welcome Michael. Wendy Ham, the Executive Director for AFOA BC. Brianna Julian, the Director for Indigenous Business Development Services with Haida Gwaii Community Futures and Paul Macedo, the Communications Director for Candu. Welcome, panelists. It's really exciting to have you here and I'm really excited to talk to you today. We are gonna have three buckets of questions around connectivity, what it means to your organization, what your organization needs to improve connectivity and how your organization helps Indigenous communities achieve uh, connectivity. But before we do so, I thought it'd be helpful for our audience to have a little bit of context and information about yourselves. So I'm gonna ask each of you to just provide a little bit of information on you and the organization. Uh, can we start with you, Michael? Thank you. Um, my name is Mike uh, Bonshaw. I'm a member of the Zaudino First Nation of uh, King Kamenlet and um, one of the things I do is is uh, is um, manage and support the First Nations Business Development Association, which we started uh, sort of mid-pandemic, um, about uh, five years ago or so. And um, the association is comprised of uh, uh, our membership is comprised of First Nation development corporations from from across the province. Happy to. Happy to see everyone today. Thanks, Michael. Happy to have you here. Wendy? Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Wendy Ham, and I'm the executive director of AFOA BC, which stands for the Aboriginal Financial Officers Association of BC. We have, uh, we were founded in 1996, so we've been around for quite a while. And uh, we were when we were founded as a nonprofit organization to assist the uh, professional development and networking opportunities of financial managers within indigenous communities. Um, we now our mandate is uh, inclusive of uh, First Nations band administrators and managers, elected officials, economic development corporations, and community members. Um, and we have uh, um, a membership of over 300 members. Um, we are also part of a national organization, AFOA Canada, which has um, members uh, across Canada in about 1,500 members across Canada. Um, so we work closely doing um, conferences, workshops, and, uh, and other presentations to First Nations community finance managers and band administrators um, around the province. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Brianna? Hi, hello everybody. My name is Brianna Julian. I'm the Director of Indigenous Business Development Services here in British Columbia, and I'm a member of the Dekas Nation in the Central Interior. I was born and raised on Coast Salish territory on the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and I now live on Haida territory on the beautiful archipelago of Haida Gwaii. Indigenous Business Development Services, IBDS, is a provincial-wide organization, but we operate out of one of the most remote areas in BC, so connectivity is a huge part of IBDS and how we connect with our partners and share our services. The focus of IBDS is to support Indigenous entrepreneurs through workshops, webinars, and partnerships with organizations around the province to make entrepreneurship training more accessible to Indigenous entrepreneurs. 
Without connectivity, IBDS would not be able to operate. So I'm grateful and excited to participate in today's conversation. Thanks, Thanks Brianna. And last but not least, Paul. Hi, good morning. I'm Paul Macedo, Communications Director with CANDU, the Council for the Advancement of Native Development Officers. Um, national incorporated uh, nonprofits started in 1991, so coming on 30 years, if that's the right math. And our focus is on our members, which are comprised of economic development officers working in Indigenous communities right across the country. Um, the work of EDOs is really critical because they create immediate impact on the economic development and the, the vibrancy of uh, Indigenous communities. And so we've, um, we've committed ourselves to empowering them, giving them resources, giving them training opportunities, such as BC Links to Learning and multiple other events that we coordinate to um, give them the skill set to create that impact um, in Indigenous communities. Because um, Indigenous communities that have uh, a vibrant and healthy economic um, um, life or um, uh, opportunities uh, are more self-reliant uh, and can uh, forge their own paths in the future. So uh, that's a critical step for us. Uh, in recent years, our efforts have gone beyond EDOs and looked at entrepreneurship and, and business development and, and the kind of skill sets that that's required to uh, assist uh, business development in the communities as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Paul. Okay, with that, it's gonna kick off our uh, discussion. So the first question is around connectivity. What does it mean to your organization and your members? And is there any difference between those two um, perceptions or does it consistently mean one thing? How about you start, Wendy? Sure. Um, yeah, I think connectivity to our membership is in incredibly important, uh, especially at this time of year, um, because our membership makes up uh, a lot of finance uh, officers and, and during this pandemic, uh, it's really important that they be able to connect with their auditors and, and such on a... Um, uh, remotely, because uh, you know, with with this pandemic, of course, we cannot get together and 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 share. So, but um, but further to that, I think that um, you know, communication is a key for any um, any organization, and uh, and how you communicate. And we we've, we've been very blessed um, this year to be able to have the technology to be able to still maintain our relationships with our members um, because we're, you know, through, through virtual events. And I think we all find that we're finding new and innovative ways to try and do that. Um, and coming up with I, I, every day, I seem to hear about a new and, and interesting kind of interactive way to connect and and we were just talking about this when before all everybody came on is you know even with the zoom meetings you know we like this interactive the the meeting style rather than the webinar style because it gives them more chance of interactivity to just see people see people's faces though everybody has their 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 videos turned off right now but uh, it's nice to be able to when you're trying to give a presentation to be able to see people engaging and even just nodding and 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 engaging um, in this kind of format rather than being just a talking head on a screen. So, um, yeah, I, I really think that uh, the interactivity is so important, and um, uh, and I think that that's one of the things that uh, the way that we stay sane and connect. He's saying and connect. Agreed. <laughs> Very true. I think we can really, uh, that resonates with us over the last year. Paul, I saw you nodding a lot. Do you want to add your call? I was just helping Wendy out by nodding because she said she liked it. No. Um, for us, uh, connectivity is, is twofold. It, it's, you know, one part of it is the technological and uh, the infrastructure um, nuts and bolts of it. The other part of it is the networking and the relationship building. And it's the latter, the networking and relationship building that CANDU has worked on for 30 years. Well, until uh, the pandemic hit, um, you know, we were using social media, we were using multiple ways to 
to create the connection, create the networking and the linkages. And of course, in the 90s and the early aughts, it was with a magazine, things you could print and things you could hand over or events where people could shake hands and, and pat each other on the back. And now that's evolved into uh, likes and followers and all of that good stuff on social media. And, you know, we, we look for every opportunity to engage with EDOs. We, we look at our EDOs as kind of the information hub in the community, not only into the community. So we're, you know, uh, we're providing them with skills and resources and, and contacts in the hopes that they would then either use those resources themselves or pass that on to those in the community that they see could benefit. But we also use them as a hub to share their information with us, to let them know, let us know what resources they need, where their weaknesses are, what, what, what opportunities they're looking for, so that we could try to match that and again, continue that back, back and forth. But what we found over the last number of years is that the information isn't necessarily can-dos to share. It's those members that have it. Maybe they're, they're breaking new ground. They're creating new opportunities. And it's for us to take that and share it with others and kind of create those linkages and, and make those connections. And we just stand by as a third party. You know, go ahead. You know, we, we make the introductions and then we stand back and let them do their thing. Um, so... But with, with the pandemic, now we realize that you can't really do the networking and the linkages of the sharing without that first part, which was the technological and infrastructure. You know, now we have to, how, how strong is your Wi-Fi connection? Do you have a Wi-Fi connection? Where's that landline plug into? Uh, who has access? Um, how can I get access to the high speed and not leave my house? when all the high speed is at the admin office or at the school. That's, that's a challenge. I'll just leave it at that. So essentially the connection means information and sharing, but now it's, I'm not gonna say impossible, but it's tightly tied to being able to connect in terms of the classic internet connection. So what have you seen, Paul? I'm just curious over the last year because of these there's additional challenges. What's worked best in, in, the, in the communities, both from like the information you're sharing to the EDOs, EDOs to communities, and communities amongst themselves, and then back to the EDOs and to CANDU? Wow. Um, yeah, a, a number of things have worked, and a number of things are still in development. Um, so the, the problem is in communities, um, the infrastructure really doesn't go beyond um, you know, some of the main uh, connection points. Uh, so it goes to the admin office, it goes to the schools, goes to some of the resource centers, but the connectivity between there and the homes, individual homes is where it's lacking, especially in remote communities. Uh, there's a, we, we see a huge disparity between urban populations or near urban populations and rural and remote communities and, and their access points. So, you know, it, even in BC, the lack of cell towers in many communities means, you know, your you have to drive in your car to get your phone to work for a while. Um, and so that, be that becomes problematic. That becomes, so, uh, you know, information and connectivity is delayed or um, non-existent. And so those delays create create issues. It certainly creates issues during, um, you know, natural uh, weather events, uh, you know, natural disasters. It could really be a problem. And, and we're, we're identifying that now. We're identifying those, you know, if you have a problem connecting to Zoom for a webinar on um, uh, disaster preparedness, you probably aren't going to be prepared for a disaster. Um, and so there's, it's like the pointy end of the wedge is all of a sudden it's like, well, if I can't connect to my other EDOs across the country through this webinar, what does that mean for my community in a, you know, the bigger scheme of things? And so now communities are really sitting down and, and, and fast tracking the process of um, 
you know, building that infrastructure or continuing to build the infrastructure. Um, I've got some so, follow-on questions, but I want to give the rest of the panel a chance. Yeah. I also want to let everybody know that uh, the session ends at noon, but we will have a Q&A session near the end. And so feel free to add questions as they come up. And we've got a couple polls for you as well. Michael, I saw you nodding there a little bit too. In terms of your members, what are you seeing that the connectivity or how has connectivity changed in meaning for them over the last year? And how are they addressing these challenges, meaning in order to connect and share information, they require the necessary infrastructure when that might be lacking? Well, I think um, I'm glad Paul brought that up because the uh, our reality in terms of our of our infrastructure gap is is drives a lot of our capability to to connect and to to um, you know effectively manage our business affairs and, and just manage our governance as well. I think it's it's um, it's critically important that uh, we all have a really good understanding of what that gap is and. Um, um, you know, some of the work that's being done provincially and nationally uh, sort of highlights the fact that about half of our communities don't have reliable access to to internet and and and, uh, and cellular. And so, you know, when uh, you just think in terms of the past year, being able to not just manage your day to day, but manage the manage all the um, challenges that uh, the pandemic has brought about in terms of being able to ensure that your community is safe, ensure that your community is informed, ensure that you're uh, connected to the outside world as well, because, um, you know, the, especially, you know, obviously, especially lately, um, you know, the sort of the rules around what we can do and where we can do it are, are changing on a a weekly, if not daily basis. And so, um, you know, it's really put a strain on our community's ability to, um, to be able to, you know, I think it, I would assume that at best we're, we're treading water, you know, we're just trying to stay safe, trying to, trying to keep the, keep the lights on and so on in that, you know, that's obviously had, having an economic impact in terms of being able to, uh, manage our current business business activities, pursue new business activities, and so on. So it's um, the uh, I sit on a, a national and indigenous economic development board, and, and that, that's one of our. Uh, we recently, I've re, I'm new to the board, but we recently struck up a connectivity committee as well to help address this. And, and kind of what struck me and in, in some of our early discussions on that was there isn't really a national plan in place to address our this gap um i think i think we're maybe we're fortunate here in bc that at least we have a fairly good understanding what that gap is because that allows you to make some plans and understand the the level of investment required but i'm not sure that's the case in in the rest of the country so um the you know that uh, you know, that that's part of the work that that we're we're taking on and on, on that board. Okay, thanks, Michael. Brianna, anything to add? Yeah. So for us at IBDS, uh, connectivity is the basis of everything we do. We we do all entrepreneurial training. So um, pre-COVID, that looked like connecting with different organizations and partners around the province and. Uh, at that time, we were only doing in-person workshops, which, you know, is great for so many reasons and building connection and that face-to-face. -face. Um, but obviously, that was no longer possible once COVID hit. And so we really had to look at how we are connecting with our clients. And is it best to still do that through different organizations and partners throughout the province? Or is this something that now IBDS needs to be directly looking at um, reaching and connecting with our clients? which ultimately it is, but that was a new venture for us since we never um, were reaching our clients directly. Um, so it was a big change in 2020, building up our social media and our website, 
And um, early on, we got a partnership with Small Business BC to bring uh, Indigenous-focused entrepreneurial training onto their platform, which was great because we were just able to reach so many new clients. Um, so yeah, connectivity, it, it's everything for IBDS, but it's, it's changed a lot and we're still adapting every day. And of course, um, you know, as Paul and Michael kind of were talking about the internet connectivity. And so now that's a really big challenge to us because we are a service for people in remote areas of British Columbia. And so we need them to have strong internet connection to be able to access our training services. And that's just not currently the case. Um, many people don't have high speed internet in their home and they wouldn't be able to participate in a Zoom meeting. Um, maybe they could download something that, that's online. It might take some extra time, but definitely that's a huge barrier for us and something we've been thinking a lot about how we can connect with them in, a, in what their infrastructure is right now for internet and connectivity. Um, but I guess we can talk a little bit more about that in the second question. Yeah, I was thinking about that, but Brian, it's really interesting because you shift sort of the whole experience or relationship with your clients because of COVID to become mm -hmm. more direct or sorry, point to point. When you talked about leveraging the third party platform, the social media, the marketing aspects. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting was, and probably not surprising, is that that opportunity then lent itself to a new challenge, which is how do you have that same relationship in those remote areas? And yes, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's really interesting. We have a poll, but before um, the poll, actually we had our first question. So I'm actually gonna uh, put the panel on the spot and ask you our first question, which is how do communities ensure that their connectivity and infrastructure are up to date or sufficient enough for, to, for growth? So essentially, how do you make sure you have what you need, right, with, within a changing landscape? Who'd like to take that one first? It's a tough one. Well, I'll take the first crack at it, and then Michael, then um, then the rest of the group can correct me. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I'm unfortunately, you know. We're still in a at a time where where uh, communities are are still working to ensure they have adequate housing and, and adequate water services, and so you know how do we ensure we have adequate technology? I mean, I mean it's a it's, it's a situation that's that's that requires solutions at both the provincial and and federal level. And uh, uh, from a community standpoint, you know the same same planning, the same measures, the same um, uh, sort of work that you have to do to address those other basic infrastructure needs. I think has to be take. I think the lack of technology infrastructure uh, requires the same kind of attention. It, it's become a uh, it's become a basic necessity, and a um, and I think a human right as well. And so it requires it, it requires the same level of uh, uh, investment in time and, and resources, um, so that you know you almost have to be uh, because well, what is what has happened is we've we've got these lines now we've got these in an inventory of communities without basic infrastructure so you have the part of the challenge is, is try how do we get to the top of that list and it's a, it's an unfortunate reality of our communities but you know it's by being it's by being as organized as possible it's about you know having having the right financial and fiscal plan in place to to enable and attract that investment and um, i think it also requires direct attention at all levels from leadership, community leadership, senior administration, and your folks on the ground at, at a technical level to, to um, help create the space for those, those solutions to be uh, provided. Right, I, I made note of the necessity and the right. Um, I, I thought that really resonated, right? We need to consider it in the same way as we do housing and water, like you said. And so I, 
creating the the plan and then the organization around bringing that same attention externally, right, from a provincial and federal level. Anybody else want to add any response to that? Yeah, I'll just scaffold on um, what Michael said. Is it's it's extremely difficult for an individual community to um, just decide for itself that it's going to create uh, a robust, um, innovative, uh, uh, infra you know, build that infrastructure by itself. It, it needs partners. It need it certainly needs um, you know multiple. Um, representatives at the table, uh, like Michael said, provincial and federal. Uh, but of course, um, it also needs um, the big, the big players. Um, you know, Rogers. It needs Shaw. It needs Bell. It needs, um, you know, Sasktel, BCTel, whatever they're called now. Tell us. It, those folks are the ones that turn on and turn off the spigot for connectivity. And um, certainly, um, you know, there's some First Nations pushing, but again, uh, the ones that have been successful are the ones that are uh, on or near uh, urban centers that, that can kind of fairly quickly tie into the existing infrastructure. Um, and how do we get that infrastructure to more remote communities? So, you know, a lot of representatives need to be in the room. Uh, you know, you can't just look at and say, well, if, you know, if that in the, if that First Nation or that Indigenous community thought it was a priority, they would take care of it. Well, there's multiple priorities, like Michael said. There's multiple priorities, and they're they're trailing on a number of those priorities. So, you know, how do you advance? How do you catch up, and then r race ahead on each of those? That's a difficult challenge. You know, how can you be positioned for growth if you're if you haven't even caught up yet? So, you know, and I don't have the answer to that other than people with answers need to get into the room. That's what we do with our EDOs. We don't have the answers, but you do. So get in the room, talk to, the, talk to each other and piggyback on some ideas and kind of support one another. That's what needs to happen in this case, I think. Um, we, yeah, I, I also think that we need to figure out ways to, to reduce the barriers. Um, of, of getting that kind of infrastructure in place. I know, I, I mean, I, I think of my own experience when I worked uh, uh, with, a, with a First Nation community and we were just trying to get our administrative buildings. We had kind of two different buildings in, you know, physically in not, you know, in, not in the same location. And we were just trying to get connectivity between those two buildings. And I had to actually apply to the CRTC for a, um, for a non-broadcast uh, license so that I could run fiber cables along the phone poles. I had to get authorization from BC Hydro to use their poles. I had to, I mean, it was, it was a daunting task just to connect two buildings together. Right. And not knowing where to start and where, you know, to, to go, it, it was um, it was crazy. Right. And so I think that, you know, being able to share those experiences and, and, and be able to just um, uh, to, to talk about those kinds of things and where those those uh, those issues or where those barriers are. And I mean, it took months to even get that done just because of the capacity issues, you know, the resources, just the time to be able to fill out all of these, um, all of these, uh, you know, forms and everything like that. So, I mean, it, it, it does become, those, those barriers become great. And if you can somehow um, engage, you know, maybe multiple communities together to be able to do it together, um, is uh, probably one of the ways that, that you can try to overcome some of these things, but it is a, it's a, it's a constant challenge. Anybody else want to add anything? Brianna, did you? Yeah, yeah I, um, I'm thinking a lot about our, our poor connection that we have here on Haida Gwaii and how much we've struggled with that over the years. 
And, um, you know, I, I think that when we need the big organizations, the TELUS, the Rogers, to come in and, and help support us. But I also think that we need follow through. Um, we have TELUS here on Haida Gwaii. However, they operate uh, out of a sub company called Mascon. So they're nowhere near as good as the full blown TELUS is. And so now we have to deal with this third party that I think operates out of Kelowna or Kamloops or something. They're not even here. We can't even go into the office. Um, and we, there's, you know, uh, four main communities along the highway on Haida Gwaii and uh, they lay the subsea cable along the whole highway, but they only actually connected like one small area of one community. And otherwise they basically just said, the fiber cable's there and now it's up to you to, to finish it. And it's expensive. Like people don't have the money if they live off the highways, the community doesn't have the money to bring it into the community. Um, I'm very fortunate that I happen to be living along the road that they did connect it to the houses. So as you can see, I'm in my home because if I was in my office, I wouldn't have strong enough internet to participate in this phone call. Um, so, you know, we really need to, to see follow through, I think, and support from bigger organizations. And I, I imagine that it's a lot of work on the community level to actually get that to happen. Um, but yeah, it, it's what's needed. It, it just needs to happen, end of story, because it is a basic necessity at this point. Right, so the idea of like highlighting externally, formulating plan and organization around highlighting the, that this is a necessity and right. The idea of like reducing the barriers to entry, to follow through, and um, also the engaging multiple communities. I think part of this will dovetail also well into the second question. But before we go there, I'm gonna, set up our first poll. So let me just bring it up. I'm going to launch it. So if everyone can just respond, what does, you know, connectivity mean to them? And what's one of the things that seemed to come through pretty repeatedly is that um, it's very difficult to have any sort of communication or contact or connection um, without internet. Uh, I'm going to close it up in just a couple seconds. Let's see if we can, the last few folks. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end it. So what's interesting is that all of the above with 73, which is what kind of the whole, part of I think with the, the rationale for this panel when Paul actually for, we were talking to Paul on how to structure it, right? The, what does connectivity mean? We ultimately default to, well, actually connectivity means just being online. But in reality, any sort of connection today requires getting online and here are the, the challenges. So let's move into the next question, which is what does uh, your organization need to improve connectivity? And so with that, we're like, what are the quick wins? What require partnerships and more time? What are the ones that need additional support? And what does that look like? And so part of it, like, Brianna, your earlier response started to segue into this, in, as well as the response of the whole panel to the question, right? Which is, here's some things that we can do, and then also some things that can help immediately. Because that whole, for example, when you talked about reducing the barriers, Wendy, I immediately thought about over COVID, one of the things that we learned was, it is, we are able to pivot fairly quickly to reduce paperwork required to change, you know, bylaws. So uh, approaching these, these uh, cumbersome kind of processes with the same approach so that it reduced that the barrier kind of thing. So I'm going to open it up to the panel in terms of like what, does your, like, what does your organization need to improve connectivity? And in that thinking about your own organization for what you do day to day, but also then what your members are, are saying that they require. And what I think it'll be interesting also to hear the different between the members, because I think that, Michael, your member set's a little bit different because it's more businesses than, than um, the rest of the folks. So um, let's start with you, Brianna. Well, at this point, the biggest thing we need is high-speed internet. We need our, our clients to be able to access our services by the internet. Um, so that's definitely the first and foremost. But second would be partnerships with other organizations around the province. Um, are they looking at ways that we can work together to uh, create more training around entrepreneurship or whether that's us looking at if we can bring our services onto their platform, if they have a bigger audience? 
Um, those are kind of the two main things. However, there's one big looming thing and that would be more funding. The more funding we have, the more we can do and uh, the more services we can share. So uh, I think those are probably the three main for IBDS. You talked a little bit about terms of the types of um, partnerships on the platform. What's required for the, on the platform side? for you able to deliver the service? Um, it really depends. I mean, you know, with Small Business BC, they already have their platform. They use Adobe Connect. Um, but I don't think that that's necessary. Uh, you know, you can use Zoom. There's so many different platforms at this point. So I actually think that that is probably a pretty easy solution at this point. Um, it would more just be sharing our services, seeing how we can work together. Um, another big thing that we did with IBDS is we are focusing on only having our training facilitated by Indigenous facilitators. Um, I think it's, you know, any other Indigenous people here can agree. It, it, we don't have enough of our own people coming and doing the training. It's always people from outside the community coming in and then they just leave. And there's no representation in that for us. Um, and also then, you know, if you want to look at economic development and we're supporting Indigenous entrepreneurship, I should be supporting Indigenous entrepreneurs that are facilitators and teachers and leaders. So um, that's a big focus on our funding. So I think for us, you know, partnerships with other Indigenous organizations is huge. Um, but partnerships with larger organizations that are trying to break into the market of supporting Indigenous people, that's also big, you know. I think we all need to work together at this point and, and uh, share our services and create programming and make things more accessible. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, Paul, do you want to go next? Um, so most of our efforts are put into things we can control. Um, so what we can control is we can control the number of webinars we deliver, the number of uh, different topics and the subject matter experts we put in front of people, the um, trying to get the word out and so on. I mean, we joke around at our office that our goal in, um, in early 2020 was to have five webinars in the whole year. That was our, that was our goal because we have to get into this webinar and this Zoom stuff. And by July, we were delivering five webinars a week. And we continued that pace until last week. So for us, it was how do we continue to um, feed uh, the information hunger that's in the communities, that's in the EDOs? How do we continue to do that without in-person events? We know in-person events are highly effective. It's a great way to network. It's a great way to reconnect and, 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 and build off the energy that you're going. But what if those don't exist? What if those won't exist for, uh, at that time, in, in, back in March of 2020? Well, what if that takes six months? What if that takes a year? Now it's like, well, what if it takes another year? So we have to do something. And so we chose to um, put our energies into those things that we can control and, and, and create um, those opportunities right away. But in so doing, it's, it's made us very aware that not all communities are equal, that not all communities have access. What can we as can do do about it? Well, uh, not much in terms of, uh, you know, putting in wire and laying uh, fiber networks and that kind of thing. But we can lobby, we can push, we can talk, we can uh, build partnerships, like Brianna said. Uh, partnerships is connectivity. That's what we're doing. We're reaching out to those that have that ability, have that power, have that those resources, and pushing them every chance we get, pushing them. Um, and, and um, you know, to, uh, to take it one step further, this is a huge opportunity uh, for Indigenous communities and Indigenous um, suppliers, entrepreneurs, to um, build a business, grow their business, like partner, um, 
you know, why, why isn't that company on Haida Gwaii that works for TELUS, why isn't that indigenous owned? Why isn't that indigenous controlled? Why doesn't it have just as much power or just as much, you know, why does it have to be TELUS light? Why can't it be TELUS equal, but just controlled and, and operated? So, you know, that's, some of that is pie in the sky, but some of, them is very, some of that is very realistic, building those partnerships and saying, how can we turn this, instead of a helicopter opportunity for those guys in Vancouver or those guys in Toronto to come in, why can't we create our own homegrown version, partner, find resources, find funds, find um, those with technical know-how and, and create an opportunity not only to build the infrastructure, but also build economic opportunity. Right. That's my Thank speech. You. You no, know, it was fantastic. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody, we will have Q&A at the end, but feel free to drop your questions as you have them in chat. Um, that the scaffolding, I'm taking away the scaffolding, which you mentioned earlier, Paul, and then the TELUS equal versus light. I thought that was also really good. Um, I'm going to be a, trying those out as well. I think that's a, that's a good one. In terms of the partnerships, um, Brianna gave us a little bit of information to, description to the partnerships she was looking for. What about for yourselves or to achieve these kind of like um, um, community rich representation of the, the services that, that you require? What, what kind of partnerships could help enable that? that to the floor? Sure. I was, yeah, Michael, why don't you go ahead? Well, I, I don't want to preempt Wendy. I, I, no, you go right ahead, Michael. <laughs> uh, I did want to say, um, because, because the, uh, the large telcos have been mentioned more than once, that um, the, the the the, in, the situation that Brianna mentioned in Haida Gwaii, I, I heard that situation that, that exists in other areas too, where um, kind of where the profitability drops off, the line ends and the, the last mile or whatever is, is just isn't done because, because someone has allowed that to happen. So a regulation has allowed that to happen. A contract from somebody has allowed that to happen. And so in terms of the, the bigger question of how we resolve this, I think we need to change those conversations. And I, I, I um, you know, I have to, you have to wonder about, uh, I mean, I think of the example in Maori where they created their own cellular company. You know, they, they had to go to their own Supreme Court to, to state their case and they ended up with their own national cellular company. And I think, I think we need to look at all of those uh, all of those layers that have become sometimes helpful, but most times a barrier, whether it be the uh, whether it be government regulation or the larger companies that control the contracts and control the airspace and so on, that hasn't worked for us. That what do we need to do to change that? And um, so we're not left with having to deal with these problems that they, they didn't want to deal with. So that's a bit of a so that's a bit of a soapbox, but I think that's part of what we're looking at it, at least at a, at a national level too. And I think here in BC, they're asking the, asking the same questions that, you know, that shouldn't be allowed to happen. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think your question was about partnerships. Um, well, I was, I was just wondering from the comments Paul had made around the partnerships, but yeah. open to everybody. Also interested for you, Michael, in terms of like connectivity, um, improvements that you or the, your members need like where are the quick wins and right. where are the ones that might need additional support and what does that look like you know yeah thanks for that you know, i think the interesting thing is that i mean our our association like everyone uh we're, we're a provincial body and so in some ways having to do business this way probably expedited our 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 necessity to start doing work this way through Zoom and through, and it, I mean, it, in some ways it's created some conversations and it's created some opportunities for discussion that we might not have had otherwise, because, you know, we're, we're bringing in folks from the US or from the East Coast to engage with, with our membership and so on. And we, and we might not have done that uh, if, 
if we were operating under what was normal business a year or so ago, you know, just because of the costs involved and so on. And so in some ways it, it's, it's enabled our, our work, but um, in terms of the association itself, we, you know, we're new, we're, we're less than a year old, but you know, we, we, are, we are working on a uh, website, an online platform and an online venue to share uh, information amongst our membership at a kind of a strategic level. How did you solve this problem? How did you solve that problem? So we're, we are looking in some ways, firstly, to our online presence to answer some of those questions and create the venue for our membership from, to learn from each other. And so, I mean, that's just our reality. I mean, because we don't, uh, uh, we want to make it as it's, we want to make, bring solutions to the table that are as relevant and expedient and timely as possible. And so we sort of see that as you know, one of the best ways to, to, to address that. That. Wendy, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, partnerships are, are becoming, a, I, I think, you know, we're all recognizing that the power of, of, of partnering with other organizations to be able to get information out. I know, um, you know, uh, just the online presence and the social media presence and all of that, but, you know, there are many Indigenous organizations, organizations out there, and I think it's really important that we all work together to try and, A, raise awareness um, with those, uh, you know, with the, with the governments, with the provincial governments and federal governments and, and such, the, um, of, of the issues that we're facing, you know, within those communities, just as we've been talking about, but also being able to bring um, all of that information from those different organizations like Can Do and AFOA and, you know, uh, Brianna's organization and Michael's and, and to, so that people have a place to be able to go and look for that, that sort of stuff because it can get so daunting to be sitting in your, your, your band office and trying to figure out where you even look for the information and, and the partnerships and, and who do you go to and how do you do that. And I think it's all of our responsibilities to try and be able to develop our websites, I mean, and, and develop our social media platforms and things like that where people can, instead of, you know, that they can look for it, right, or go out to it and, um, and be able to access uh, that information readily. Wendy, that is such a great segue into the next question, which yeah. is around how does your organization help Indigenous communities achieve connectivity? Like what you're saying is uh, well, each of you having sort of that web presence with the information could be an important first step. Yes, I yeah. think so. Very um, much so. Yeah, and I, I wrote down that it's daunting, daunting from sitting in your um, band office where to go to. So that's also interesting and then how to cross pollinate the information so on the on the aspect of like how to help the indigenous communities achieve connectivity curious first how do you measure success like is it the speed everyone has access to is it that everybody has access like what's the minimal level and then what's the benchmark that you're hoping that you would wish to see who wants to take that first? I would, um, I would say that uh, you measure success by um, having a comparison to um, those in non-Indigenous communities. That's success. So if, if as many people that want to connect can connect, check that box. If those that do connect are getting the resources and the materials in a timely manner, check that box. Um, so it's all of the above. It's uh, it's this. It's basically comparable connectivity to everyone else. If it's if it's a right, if it's uh, the way, f if it's the path forward to communicate, if it's the path forward to build business then that path forward should be comparable to everyone else's path forward, regardless of um, your heritage, regardless of your geographical proximity, regardless of you know, um, every, every other factor. 
it, it should be comparable. If you want it, you should get it. Everyone's nodding their heads. Does anyone want to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think for IBDS, the, the base would be um, internet support, of course. And then uh, what lets us know that we're succeeding is when Indigenous people feel that they have access to whatever they need to start their business for entrepreneurship training, um, website support, uh, photo photography for you know, their products. Um, just, you know, feeling like they can start and grow their business from wherever it is that they are. Um, and sometimes this also means support from their own economic development in their community. Um, but yeah, I think that it, for us, it would be that entrepreneurs make sure that they have what they need to move forward and grow their business and connect with clients um, or customers or whatever it is that they need. Michael or Wendy? I also think it's important that it, Indigenous organizations such as ourselves, all of us, um, be able to, uh, you know, bring awareness, you know, um, about these issues to, you know, I did last fall, I did a, a presentation with a group that I, I didn't even know existed, but they are the um, they regulate financial institutions and uh, and uh, insurance agencies and and they actually did a huge study through the University of Manitoba on you know connectivity just to financial institutions from a uh, from you know indigenous communities that are far far you know more remote and and just to bring that to government you know to policy. Um, makers within government just so that they, they understand that that you know that that this is an issue and uh and if we can raise that awareness that certainly helps with um uh you know in trying to engage those partners to support that going forward yeah i mean that's that's a um I guess I guess I think of uh, you know we're we're a young community. I mean I'm not young, but we're <laughs> we're overall First Nations demographically are are younger than the rest of the population, and our our young people are early adopters of technology, and so you know we need to. You know, it's almost two different conversations. So the infrastructure its issue is an infrastructure issue, and it requires a different kind of conversation. And and I agree with Wendy in terms of collaboration and mutual support amongst organizations that can that can and further that along. But I think we need to, you know, one way we can measure our success is the level of engagement by our young people in decision making and in business creation and community development. Um, because they'll, you know, they're infinitely more comfortable, familiar, used to, have grown up in, in this technology age. And so we can't let that, we can't let that opportunity pass. Yeah, that is, yeah, I made note of that. Uh, and I saw Paul nodding vigorously. <laughs> it, it, remind, it, it reminds me of the adage, um, you know, uh, never waste um a good crisis right so the crisis of this pandemic has opened our eyes to where we need to focus some attention and now that everybody is paying attention to to it we need to push that this agenda forward we need to really uh partner with other like-minded organizations and lobby hard so that we can take advantage of this crisis so that the next crisis, whether it's national in scope or international or just local, that the next crisis will be all better prepared to deal with it. Yeah, and in a way, you know, this might sound um, overly optimistic. I actually think COVID with that was great, right? Because those challenges, those issues always existed 
Yes, they were exacerbated through COVID, but I think the other thing that it did, that COVID did, not just draw attention to it, but it demonstrated we are able to solve important problems quickly in new ways, right? And so if we were to apply, I think that same sort of approach, you know, you know going back to even Wendy's comment on the CRTC, right? we were actually able to change bylaws when it came to parking or where you were able to drink. So why not look at those and how like people can get online if that is even more critical than being able to you know, drink or park wherever, wherever you need to. Um, I have a couple other questions. We're, we're at quarter two, so we'll be opening up for Q&A fairly soon. But again, anybody who has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm curious from our panel, um, in terms of the, the connectivity aspect, both from a connection transfer of information and then separately infrastructure, understanding that that's inherently required and also needed for the connection point. Do you have any sort of, um, do you work with other groups currently? Some of you have already mentioned it, but you also, do you have any sort of plan and how to find these other partners or look at lobby? Lobbies come up quite a bit, right? Um, so, how are you working today with other organizations or how do you plan to, to that end? Anybody want to take that? Well, we've, um, uh, our association has begun to develop the framework for a indigenous digital economy strategy. And so recognizing that uh, we want to help to create an environment where more First Nations are involved in technology-based companies. And so it'll be through, it'll be through that strategies development and implementation that we'll be sort of seeking out the uh, partners in the industry, partners in government to, to, to support that. And so that's sort of where our attention is in, in, in this space right now. Brianna or Wendy or Paul, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I think um, one of, yeah, us too. I, I would, uh, um, we're very much trying to ensure that our, you know, our website and, and um, you know, social media and that sort of thing is, is, uh, is kind of kept up to date and that we are able to provide, you know, um, information both, you know, for different types of uh, of our membership, right? To our membership and to the, just to to organizations or or to communities in general, um, just as a way to be able to access information. I think right now that that is um, such a important piece because everyone is uh, um, is looking at you know how they can get that information out to to those communities, and I also. We are always looking to collaborate. We, we work with a collaboration network that Michael is involved in and as well as can do. And, and um, you know, we meet once, you know, every quarter or so just to, to talk amongst ourselves about what kind of issues that we can champion and, and support and help out with. And so we're always, I mean, it's keeping those communication lines open um, for dialogue, which is so important. And these kinds of events like this is, uh, is a great way to get people thinking and, and get people to kind of start realizing that we're, you know, we all have very much some of the same issues. And so how can we collaborate to, to, to overcome them? Right. Yeah. <laughs> kind of build on efforts versus needs duplicating per se, because the objective is the same. Um, Anybody else wanted to add anything? Paul, it looked like you. Sure. Were say something. Yeah. Um, so in response to um, the COVID crisis, there was, um, in the initial phase, there was a tremendous shortage of PPE in Canada. And so uh, CANDU and uh, several uh, national Indigenous organizations got together that were focused on business. So... Um, we had ITAC, we had uh, CCAB, we had NACA, we had CANDU, we had uh, others uh, get together and talk about uh, how we can position or help position Indigenous businesses to 
um, provide products and services related to COVID to government because government was in desperate need and that the government would then uh, stockpile this and then, and then distribute it to the, to the individual communities and so on. And we, we had relationships with all of these organizations. We have MOUs with, uh, I think, almost all of them. And we would meet occasionally, but now we were meeting on a weekly basis. And we were marshalling all of our uh, resources, all of our collect, you know, bringing our networks all together and figuring out how we can provide a solution in the short term. How can we address this right now? And we did that to quite a, I think it was quite successful. Like there was uh, millions of dollars of uh, contracts awarded to indigenous companies to supply PPE and, and related materials. And, and I think that now that that's happening and that, that relationship, that, that uh, I guess, um, that focused relationship, that focused uh, you know, attention to this task can now be marshaled to other areas. And everybody in, on that task force, it was the COVID-19 Indigenous Business Task Force, everyone on that task force agrees that connectivity is the way for indigenous business to succeed moving forward. So we've got to marshal these resources, get all these networks together and move away, look past COVID and look at how we can develop this infrastructure to help indigenous businesses. Like Brianna said, whether the entrepreneur is on Haida Gwaii or in uh, Richmond or in Nanaimo, or in Atlin, right? Wherever they are, we can, we can do this. And now that we have this week to week working relationship with some of these uh, national partners, we now have the, the means to be able to do that. Rather than, usually it was just a touch base. You know, how's things going? What are you doing? Any new initiatives? You kind of touch base. Now it's actually, Okay, what did you do the last week? We need to move this. We need to move this agenda forward. What are you supposed to be doing? How can you help this move? You know, it's a very much task oriented and and short term focused rather than oh yeah, you know, next year we hope to do this. No, we need to figure it out. And with with our networks, we can now put pressure on those that we know that can um, that can assist. And if it's contacts. In on the provincial side, great. If it's contacts with federal, great. If it's contacts with some of these um, service providers that we all, you know, um, love and hate simultaneously, uh, then we need to, you know, and if it means pushing them into the room together with us, then we need to, we need to do that. Um, in the last few minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a poll and then I, I had a couple last things for the, for the panel again. Um, for everybody who's joined us, you can drop uh, questions in the chat. So I'm going to launch this poll um, in terms of whether or not we talked a little bit about planning and then moving, <laughs> moving from um, sort of plan to execution, what you were just saying, Paul, like it's become implementation and moving forward. So I'm curious on, and then things that we need to do to work together to achieve this. So I'm just curious in terms of, the folks listening today, how many have um, a goal already set to improve the connectivity of the organization? And then I've got a couple follow-on questions. We're just gonna let the poll run just a few more seconds. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll. So it's no surprise, it's, I would say to anybody that 100% of respondents said that yes, improving connectivity was a goal. So it got me thinking, um, in terms of what the panel has shared today and then working with partnerships and also addressing the need that's exacerbated, right? Not just in uh, remote indigenous communities and indigenous communities and with COVID. Is there a way or is there something we could think about from a grassroots level? Because everybody, as Wendy mentioned earlier, has the same goal, right? And so how do we kind of, is there a way to channel this outside of what's already been um, communicated today or the way to use um, the interest that everybody have in common to kind of like fast track somehow to achieve this this right this basic necessity everybody needs 
I know it's kind of a big question. And, it, and I'll let everybody know this was not, not prepared in advance. It just got me thinking about the, um, the, after the conversation we've had, I just started to think about, we've all, like everybody has the same goal. Is there a way, sometimes grassroots efforts can also help and is there a way to channel that same energy? I guess, uh, you know, when we first started talking about this topic of connectivity, I, you know, it, my mind went a few different directions in terms of what that what that means. And, um, you know, it, you know, we've, First Nations have survived this long because of our connection to various things. You know, our, our connection to our the lands and resources and our territory, our connection to our culture, our connection to our history that has, has enabled our our governance to survive this long. And so, you know, this this fairly, you know, the internet and email hasn't been around that long, right? In the grand scheme of things. And um, you know, Brianna can can speak to how far the stories go back in Haida. And you know, it's it's a it's a current challenge, but I, I wouldn't you know, I think I think I think the communities that can successfully sort of instill and utilize their community values to address this, sort of be at the core, at a foundational level of this of this issue and opportunity. Um, I think that that can help in the, in its success. In that, it's just a it's it's just one new element that uh, in our, in our environment that we need to we need to sort out and so uh, i guess when you when you when you use the word grassroots that's sort of what i what i go to because it's you know at the end of the day it's, it's all of those things that i mentioned in my list that that really determines the success of a first nations business having that connectivity to all those areas it, it determines the success yeah, as well as connectivity to our to our membership it's part of our governance so I'm 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 confident that we can we can figure it out. I mean, it does it does take efforts beyond our territory boundaries because of just the nature of the nature of the issue, the nature of the problem. But I'm 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 confident that we can we can figure it out. Anybody else? It looks like Brianna. Did you want to make a final comment? Very well said, Michael. By the way. Yeah, I was thinking, um, I didn't know this prior to Michael talking about the Maori people creating their own network. Um, and that's really inspired me and kind of got me thinking. And, you know, I, um, I think it's pretty obvious that we're lacking support from our provincial and federal governments in our Indigenous communities. Um, so maybe it's time to stop waiting and for us to be seeing how we can work together and create the things that we need better access i mean i know that you know that's wishful thinking there's so much funding that's involved in that and so much work but um why not you know that we we can do it, it it's going to require a lot of work but it's necessary and you know i think about um in every indigenous community i know this is a thing like when our young people finish high school or sometimes they can't even finish high school and they need to leave but they have to leave to be able to get training and a lot of the times they don't come back because we don't have the resources we don't have the jobs available for them um, and that needs to change if that doesn't change then our communities are always going to be in a vulnerable position because we're losing our young leaders you know those are the first ones to go that want to further themselves and get more training it's our leaders and we need them here in our communities so that they can be spearheading these types of things um, so yeah, I, I think that's huge. How long do you wait for a bus that's not coming? Right. <laughs> Maybe you need to buy a bus and start your own route. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I, I'm going to say that that's aspirational because I know at the at that with the backdrop of the situation is is not the one we want but i do think i do think there's there's real power and, and we and the youth has come up a few times as well right and how to rebuild these communities or have them 
come back. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna um, suggest to close the session. I wanna have a huge, huge thank you to our panel. Um, and I also want to encourage everyone who's listening to reach out or even take a look at their websites. As Wendy had stated, that's one of the ways to, I mean, be informed or, or able to access resources. So thank you very much, Michael Boncher for um, FNBDA, Wendy Ham from AFOA, I'm sorry, I said AFOA before, AFOABC, Vianna Julianne from uh, Hyder Y Community Futures and Paul Macedo from Can Do. I also wanted to encourage anyone who was looking for more information in terms of our programs or funding, please um, go to info.nbc.ca forward slash stay in the know. Um, and you can sign up for our newsletter there. Thank you so much to everyone again. Um, I actually, I, I took a lot away and I'm going to be reaching out to you guys. We, we speak anyway outside of this, but I had some ideas based on some of the great thoughts and ideas you had. And I hope this was helpful to everybody. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Thank everyone. You. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks.